A return to democracy in danger. Mali's transitional leaders are arrested and forced to step down. It's being called a coup within a coup, and the military junta is back in control. Will regional mediation resolve this crisis? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Nearly half of Mali's people live in extreme poverty, and many of them have suffered years of instability brought on by armed groups. All they want is stability and progress. Now, it looks like they may have to wait a bit longer. The dramatic events of this week have only pushed the West African nation further into chaos. The man who deposed the civilian government in August last year has once again grabbed power from people he had chosen to guide a return to democracy. There's anger on the street and fears of more violence. Regional leaders are mediating to stop that from happening, and world powers are threatening sanctions. We have a lot to discuss with our guests shortly, but first, our correspondent, Nicholas Hock, has this update from Mali's capital, Bamako. In the capital, Bamako, life is slowly going back to normal. We're just outside the residence of the official residence of the President Bao Endao, who was brought back there in the early morning of Thursday, along with the Prime Minister uh, Mokhtar One, this after spending three days in custody in the camp of Pati. Many Malians see in this release a sigh of relief for the future of this country. Malians now need to start work hand in hand and work as one. We need to stop the infighting that's destroying our country. Following Wednesday's UN Security Council meeting, there's been talks of sanctions. The EU could target the military junta themselves. The African Union could exclude Mali altogether, but that's unlikely. And then there's ECOWAS, the West African body, who had put in sanctions when there was a coup in August, closing off its borders and preventing trade with Mali. But that's unlikely because this would have a devastating impact on Malians who are already suffering from the economic fallout of the pandemic and the deteriorating security situation. A small but growing crowd outside the Russian embassy, protesters asking for Russian intervention and the end of French military presence in the country. Since 2013, there's been 5,000 troops across the Sahel. Most of them have been in the north of Mali and have succeeded in stemming out attacks. But there has been an increased pressure from armed groups in central Mali at the doorstep of the capital, Bamako. And this is what is at stake in this crisis to bring back a state that has been largely absent and unable to provide peace and security to millions of Malians. Nicholas Hawk in Bamako for Inside Story. All right, let's have a look at how democracy crumbled in Mali in recent months. Protests against the then-president Ibrahim Boubacar Keita began in June of 2020. Many accused him of corruption, economic mismanagement, and disputed his victory in the 2018 elections. Nearly a month later, several protesters were killed during a crackdown by security forces. Then, as protests continued, military leaders took power and briefly detained Keita in August, forcing him to resign. The international community condemned the coup, fearing political instability. Regional, UN, and French forces have been in Mali fighting against armed groups. Under pressure, coup leaders agreed to hand over power to civilians. Elections were due to be held after an 18-month transitional period. All right, let's bring in our guests in Bamako. Musa Kondo, a civil society activist and country director for Accountability Lab. In Dakar, Emmanuel Kwesi Anning, director of research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. And in Yaoundé, Marie-Roger Biloa, president of Africa International Media Group. A warm welcome to you all. Musa, let me start with you today. Who exactly is in charge in Mali right now? Uh, thanks so much uh, for having me here. I will go straight and tell you, assuming Goita is in the charge of uh, Bamako in Mali right now after the resign of the president and the prime minister early this morning. Marie-Roger, let me ask you. Um, so Mali's military spokesman has stated that uh, the transitional leaders, 
the interim president and prime minister handed in their resignations in the presence of the Akawas delegation led by former Nigerian president, good luck, Jonathan. Does this put Ikawas in a poor light? I mean, they are the mediator here, correctly. Does this essentially show that the military leadership in Mali is dictating the terms when it comes to mediation efforts? Absolutely. The coup within a coup is yet another expression of the belief by the military junta that they own the command on the current transition, that the power belongs to them because they were the ones who could solve the deadlock of the previous tenure by the civilian president, Ibeka, who had become very unpopular, sparking a series of riots and lootings. And as we see, the head of the military putsch, which took place nine months ago, Colonel Asimi Koita, and who had very reluctantly handed over the presidency to a civilian, Bandao, and was only vice president, is leading the show again. And uh, despite outcry and disapproval, he could enforce his decision to sideline the two civilians in the transitional government leadership. So we are dealing with petty power games at the expense of a notoriously endangered country, and nobody seems to care about the real issues and threats. Kwesi, when the delegation from Ikawas uh, met with Colonel Goita, um, they raised the possibility of sanctions against the officers responsible for this takeover. Ikawas has imposed sanctions on Mali after the coup last August, but lifted them after an 18-month civilian-led transition had been agreed to. Should we expect more sanctions to be imposed? Well, I mean, I think the sanctions regime itself was not very successful. People were able to trade. The borders are porous. But the fact that ECOWAS had sought to impose sanctions without taking into, the, into consideration the political, economic, and social realities of Mali meant that the sanctions, sanctions regime itself became an anathema and allowed people to be very critical of ECOWAS itself. So right now, any narrative or decision to reimpose those sanctions, I think, will backfire. We need a much more nuanced conversation uh, as to what really the Malian people are looking for. How do we put in place a political leadership that enjoys the trust of the people, but also can deliver social welfare and public goods. I think there's a huge gap, lacuna, between the rhetorics by the leaders about delivering social, economic, and political stab stability and their very actions. What we've experienced the last couple of days mm. is reflective of this misunderstanding as to where the power dynamics really does lie how to engage those who have the power and support the infrastructure that had been put in place towards the transition to democracy in February, mm. March uh, mm. 2022. So this actually, from where I sit, is a collective you know, failure to ensure mm. that the interests of the general Malian people were taken into consideration. Musa, from your perspective, um, how do you think mediation efforts are going thus far? And how difficult do you think mediation efforts are going to be? Yeah, um, I think they, my, my colleague just pointed something out really important and interesting. Uh, if you, you we, we take back before coming to this mediation time right now, and um, what the could happen in, in, uh, in August 2020, you know, there was just this rush for pressure, for sanction, for condemn, etc. And then uh, the mediation, you know, of course, people um, and from different angle have to, to condemn first. But for me, the role of the mediation was to, to go behind that and understand what got we here and what should we do to not be here again. So for me, this has not been uh, very well understood. And then the, the, the put pressure and get things done so quick, then uh, the real question and the real matter have not been answered. And then we find ourselves in this position. So the other colleague, what he said, 
I did not, I, I don't agree it uh, 100%. And uh, uh, this guy has it. And then put it uh, the position uh, to just say, uh, when we, we see the military coup outside of Mali, you, you just qualified is uh, something uh, the military is in the power, we should push them out, we should send them in the uh, military camp. But when you will look at it from Malian uh, inside and uh, uh, perspective is deeper than that. Mm. Because now with the political situation and sphere, the M5 RFP situation and also the, 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 the union workers uh, things on it, it's important the mediation go deeper and understand what's really need right now to finish the 10 months uh, remaining of the transition. As the uh, Colonel Asimi Goita even say, there would not, there, there would not be more date uh, than what has been concluded. So mm. they're not fighting for new terms saying we're going uh, for another year or for another two years. So what is the plan right now? There was a problem between Asimi Goita and, and the junta, I would say in general, uh, between the, the, the junta and uh, the president and the premier minister. So mm. if you don't try and understand what happened, what missing, because it's easier to point fingers on, 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 on militaries, but what happened the other side? If we don't understand this, even, even though another person is uh, nominated to become the president of the transition, we will face the same challenges and mm. maybe one or two or three months will face the same situation. Or even at the, uh, after the election, as they said, in 2022, which is still large, we don't know exactly uh, which Musa, month it could be the last day. Musa, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Let, let me get back to you about that point about the upcoming elections in, in just a moment. I want to go to Marie Roger. Um, you know, this happened just nine months after a military coup ousted the previous president. So first I want to ask you, is what happened surprising to you? And secondly, do you believe that this was a direct result of the fact that two members of the military who were also architects of the 2020 coup lost their positions in this government reshuffle that happened earlier this week. Yes, that is uh, actually the official reason, the official reason that uh, the, the uh, Mr. Asimi Koita, the colonel who took uh, back power, uh, he says they could not reshuffle the government without asking him as a vice president. So he believes they... The, the two civilians did not respect the charter of the transition. And the other thing is that in Mali, uh, there, were, there was a, a, a lot of dis discontent uh, against the former president. And there was a, a movement called uh, M5, uh, who was civilians, uh, social, uh, civil society, uh, all kinds of people who were backing, actually, the putsch, and they, they, wanted, they wanted to oust uh, Ibeka. Those, I believe, to come back now to, let's say, to have their say in the new settings, which is uh, ushered by Asimi Koita. So the, the uh, let's say, the, the way the transition government was composed was surely not perfect, was not uh, suiting many people and especially the military. So that it happens shows that uh, they, they felt they were in a position to, to change that mm. because uh, it, they see that even if uh, ECOWAS has mediation and uh, they were able in the, first, in the first place to put pressure on them and to to push them to get civilians in the government. They didn't like the idea of a mm. military transition. Mm -hmm. So the ECOWAS was able to uh, uh, somehow uh, get that because you had some civilians in the government. Uh, but they know mm -hmm. that the leverage of ECOWAS is limited. The, the, the leverage of the international community is, is limited. You cannot speak about sanctions. This is very unpopular because sanctions hit mm. mostly uh, the population. So uh, maybe they, they, they had a clear view, a clear idea of their margin of maneuver before mm -hmm. doing that. Kwesi, um, the situation in Mali was volatile long before this detention of the country's civilian leadership. How much concern is there that this could lead to further instability? And also, you know, there was an uptick in violence 
during the month of Ramadan. Is there a belief right now, is there a worry that this could lead to the resurgence of more armed groups? One is that it will lead to not only a resurgence of violence and more armed groups in Mali, but also is the symbolism of the military's ability to come back and to take power. And I think here history serves us very well. When Goiter and his team were invited to come to the ECOWAS meeting in Accra, they came in their battle fatigues, sending a signal back home to those watching them on TV that they were now rubbing shoulders with those who mattered in West Africa. They were kicked out of the room and told to dress in civilian clothing. That was a very bad psychological decision because by coming into the room in civilian clothing, it just showed that, yes, now we, we have been accepted as, as equals. Post the ECOWAS instructions to hand over power, they then left the conference venue and visited probably the most charismatic military leader in Africa after Thomas Sankara, the late J.J. Uh, Rawlings, spent a couple of hours with him before they flew back to Mali. Now, those pictures were circulated, and it is the charisma of Mr. Rawlings, mm. his ability mm. to come a second time that I am seeing playing out here. Now, when this ECOWAS meeting and the circumstances surrounding Goiter's departure from Accra came out, I had argued on your station very strongly that I thought it was a mistake to allow Goiter and his team to get a bit of inspiration from the late Mr. Mr. Rawlings. So once more, my argument is simple. The military is a critical, strong factor in Malian politics that we cannot mm. step aside. We need, we need a framework that brings on board different people whose multiple interests can be identified in that coalition regime that will be established. Look, mm. international institutions mm. and powerful states staying wherever they stay and issuing orders will never work. The demographics, the nature of the narrative, the discourses, the frustrations of ordinary people mm. are such that mm. you can issue those instructions, but you are actually just worsening the case. Let Malians sit down, create an enabling environment in which identifiable groups are brought onto the table, mm. and let them take mm. as long as possible to come to an agreement. The M5 is a powerful protest movement still in existence. The Mali National Workers Union is still powerful. It's a country riddled with armed groups mm -hmm. and weapons. Mm -hmm. Look, instructions from outside just don't work. And I'm hoping that ECOWAS will take the lead, learn from its own experiences in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, La Côte d'Ivoire, and Burkina Faso, and fashion out an inclusive process. All right. Um, located well, Quizzy, experiences I, I'm Africa. sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We are starting to run out of time. Uh, Musa, uh, earlier you were starting to talk about the elections. Um, so I want to ask you, uh, Colonel Goita has said that elections will go ahead as scheduled next year. Do you think that is likely? Are we actually going to see these elections happen, um, you know, on schedule? Uh, for now, what I've seen, um, I believe this is the way, because if it was not, they would say, okay, we start, we start it all again. But they say, we keep going on the transition and respecting the chart. What my colleague and the former say about M5 and, uh, and, and the Junta right now, I think this is something incredibly important, because finding the right person and helping Malians to get the right uh, path to end this transition is the one, is the thing uh, ECOWAS and all the international uh, collaborators or partners should focus, not going to a checking boxes, because the election is the one which will take out from this circle. And uh, focusing on a junta or not junta will really not help today. And when we say how the, the things happen in Chad, we've seen this a couple of days ago. And today we've seen what happened in August. Uh, 2020, with the pressure and the say you should do this, you should do that. 
get us where we are right now. When my colleague firstly said the, the reasons of why the president and the first and prime minister have been arrested, there are a lot of other reasons she, she did not mention. And I want to point it out, it's not about uh, because they had, there is a, that, that's why civil society has not been much more engaged against the arrest of uh, the, pre the president and, and uh, the, the premier minister. Because since three months, we Malians here were living with this uh, a challenging situation between the president and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the junta. Mm. So it kind of uh, brings situation where people expect it. So are we keep going through this circle or we should all work together to have a, a, a Malian have a, 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 an open conversation and find the right person to end the, the, the transition with the, the fair and transparent election. I think this is the right thing we should focus right now. Marie Roger. When, when we go for. I'm oh, sorry, go, yeah. go ahead, Moses. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, but by going through sanctions right now, it's not just as, as like we are, we are in a normal context right now. We have, as she, as she said, we have a, 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 a huge terrorist and, and, and jihadism uh, uh, insecurity and attacks happening all around the country. So when you you struck the, the instrument, the military and all that without uh, having access to certain things, what would be the next step in COVID-19 context as well? So we should think about all this and the magician should bring such kind of uh, mm. para, uh, things into the concerns, into the negotiation and the magician to find the right and design a solution which will be peaceful, which will be transparent and would be acceptable for, mm. for Malians first before any other person. Marie Roger, um, how much does all what is going on in Mali have uh, when it comes to the potential to contribute to regional instability? Well, um, you know, we, we cannot uh, put aside what happened in chat. You know, um, we can see a link between the fact that there was a, a real coup, a pooch in chat a couple of weeks ago and it was endorsed by President Macron and, uh, well, by other African leaders, in a way, and everybody seemed to find that natural or normal or acceptable. So, uh, and now, uh, what we see, uh, like, like I mentioned, Mr. Asimi Koita, I'm sure he has that in mind, that nothing happened in Chad after the coup. And uh, he say, probably talked uh, due to the situation which everybody is witnessing, due to tensions, due to the fact that uh, part of uh, 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 civilians, uh, part of Malians in it have been striking. You know, the country didn't was not working, and that people were un unhappy. That he would have good reasons to change the settings of uh, of the government. So, uh, what people uh, fear is that. If we, we, we go on having instability in Mali, because what we see, a transitional government, government is already a source of, it's not a source of, it's not a sign of stability. We are transitioning to something we don't know what. Uh, and you see all the risk you have around Mali. You see those terrorist threats. You see mm -hmm. uh, the, the situation in Sahel. So, of course, there's concern about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as long as the Malians sort of stick together and, and uh, show some support to the, the transitional government, which seems to be the case, actually, mm -hmm. um, we, the, the, the danger is not higher than before. Mm -hmm. We, we see same, have the same level of, 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 uh, mm. of risk. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Musa Kondo, Emmanuel Kwesi Anning, and Marie Roger Biloa. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.